Welcome to this special Gastro Girl podcast. This episode was produced in collaboration with the American College of Gastroenterology's Patient Care Committee. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Hi, everyone. Today, we're talking a little bit about the basics of IBD and what you need to know. And today, we're joined by Dr. Justin Crocker, who is deeply involved in patient education. He not only serves on the patient care committee with the American College of Gastroenterology, but he also works with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation to help educate patients. Now, Dr. Crocker really knows the ins and outs of IBD, and I'm so grateful for his time. Of note, he's also on the faculty of Duke University, where he is an assistant professor of medicine and also sees patients at the Raleigh campus. We're so excited to have you here today. Thank you, Dr. Crocker. Oh, thank you, Jackie, uh, for having me today. As you said, IBD is an important topic. Um, a lot of people aren't familiar with what IBD means or stands for. And, and despite that, the number of cases have been rising for many years. And so more and more people either now have it or they know someone who has it. So it's important to discuss. So let's just back it up a little bit and just explain it. And IBD is short for inflammatory bowel disease. So what does that mean, Dr. Crocker? Right. So inflammatory bowel disease is a catch-all umbrella term. So uh, there are different subtypes or, or examples of inflammatory bowel disease. The two main ones that patients are likely to hear about is Crohn's disease uh, and something called ulcerative colitis. So th- when we're talking about IBD, we're really referring to one of those two conditions. Uh, people can have a mix of both, uh, and that's another flavor, but the majority of people that we encounter have either one or the other. So Dr. Crocker, what are the risk factors and who is most impacted by IBD? IBD is one of these things that's still here in 2022. We can't say exactly who's going to get it, why they get it, um, and, and why they get it when they get it. Um, th- we know that it's a very um, perfect storm that has to occur uh, for someone to be diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, which is, IBD is an autoimmune condition. So um, risk factors can be anything from how old you are uh, to what your ethnic background is uh, and family history are big ones. So we know that younger folks um, are going to be at higher risk just because when we see how old are people when they get diagnosed, the majority are somewhere between, say, 15 and 35 years old. So that's on the younger end of the spectrum. But in reality, anyone at any age can develop IBD. So no one um, you know, is out of that window necessarily uh, if they end up coming down with symptoms. So that's important to keep in mind is just because you're 60 uh, it's not something to think to yourself, well, I, I'm 60, this can't be that. So that's that's a risk factor. And then uh, certainly we know that the genes play a role. So if you have a family history, then of course you're going to be at higher risk. Uh, and then other kind of curveball things that people don't think about maybe is medications can be a risk factor. So things like ibuprofen and aspirin containing products, while they're usually used for some reason and, and they're safe and and people, they can cause some injury in the, in the intestinal tract, and that might turn on this kind of chronic inflammation to occur. Well, that's really interesting. You wouldn't think about that, but that's an interesting point. Right. Yeah. And so medic- anything that, you know, that takes us back to, well, why, why do people get this in the first place? You know, what about these risk factors? You know, why would taking medications or even smoking cigarettes or having um, a family history put you at risk. And and even though in 2022, like I said, we don't know exactly what's doing this, we do have a good sense that genes are playing a big role as they do with everything in life. Um, If you inherit genes from your parents and their parents, that plays a big part in determining what you encounter through your lifetime in terms of health. Uh, But that's not the only thing. This isn't one of those conditions where if you inherit the genes, you're born with the condition, there's just no way around it. That's only one part of the equation. You also need something to kind of prime your immune system to be the way it is. Um, And those are these risk factors. You know, smoking um, can change your immune system. You know, whether you're 
bottle fed or breast fed, or if you grew up on a farm or in the city, you know, how dirty did you get or how, how clean were you? All of that's priming how your body's immune system is. And then when the right time comes and the immune system kicks in to fight something like an infection, if you have the right genes, instead of it turning back off when the infection's done, it sticks around, the inflammation sticks around, the immune system continues to attack the bowel when it shouldn't, now it's autoimmune, now you have IBD. Yeah, it's interesting because I know that there have been studies that have shown um, increased incidence of um, inflammatory bowel disease in, in, in countries that you wouldn't think, like uh, in, in India and in um, Africa, third world countries where the cleanliness was different, different than in the US, right? We feel like we're always so obsessed with the hand sanitizer and cleaning everything and you know, when we were growing up, our mom was like, play, go play in the dirt and, you know, you know, wash your hands after you use the bathroom, but, you know, it's the floors on the floor. But, you know, we've gone into much more um, being much more mindful of cleanliness. And has that had an impact? Typically, uh, inflammatory bowel disease used to be thought of a condition that affected uh, Caucasians primarily, um, certain Jewish ethnicities, folks from uh, Eastern Europe or Northern uh, climates. Uh, that, that tended to be thought, who got this? And as time has evolved, more and more other minorities are getting inflammatory bowel disease at rates that they used to not. And part of what's driving this, we think, it could be diet. You know, this Western diet of a lot of processed foods and junk foods and soda and uh, fast food has kind of infiltrated these other parts of the world that, that used to not have that. So that we think is playing a role. And as countries do get more industrialized, so some of these countries in the past were still very rural, um, they've now become more industrialized. And are there some sort of pollutants or something that comes with industrialization that's, that's causing this? Because we do know that folks that live in more urban areas and more cities are at higher risk for inflammatory bowel disease than those living in rural uh, remote parts of, 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 of town. Well, no, thank you for that. I think this is also very fascinating, um, you know, finding out who's at risk, why they're at risk. But now that we know a little bit about some of the risk factors, what are some of the signs and symptoms? Like what would make someone wonder if they have or could be have IBD and when would they know they should go to the doctor and ask about those signs and symptoms? Yeah, IBD is can be a mimicker of a lot of things. Uh, when you see diarrhea, you don't jump to the first thought of, oh my gosh, I have IBD. Right. <laughs> uh, but diarrhea is a very common theme in someone who has inflammation in their bowel. If the bowel can't work, then you're going to have uh, not normal stools. But there's going to be more to it than just the occasional diarrhea. Uh, this tends to be something that is now the, the new normal. Um, so if you have a change in, in your bowel habits, that's now every day, all the time you're having diarrhea. Um, and there's a lot of abdominal pain with that. Those are signs that says something might be wrong here. Um, other things that definitely uh, suggest there's inflammation going on is there's now bloody diarrhea. There's blood in the stool with every bowel movement or mucus in the stool. Um, that's another big right. warning sign that something inflames happening. And then other things that can happen is the, the constant urge to go to the bathroom or you, you have such a sudden urge that you can't make it in time or after you've even gone, it feels like you need to still go and yet, you know, there's nothing else to do. So, you know, there's these weird symptoms that people might feel that are new for them. Those things plus bloody diarrhea and, and, and abdominal pain that's new for you, those would all be signs that something inflamed would be going on and you do need to talk to your doctor. No, that's good. I know I've heard other things like it's like unexpected, unexplained weight loss, maybe fatigue, things like that to, for patients to be aware of. And like you said, not to be alarmed, just go to the doctor unnecessarily. But if these things are consistent and you're concerned, you definitely want to bring them to the, to the doctor's attention. Absolutely. Yeah, there's other, um, in some rare cases, people may uh, present with something that you would never think is inflammatory bowel disease. And yet, when you look back in hindsight, that was the beginnings of it. And inflammation in the bowel, for reasons we still don't fully understand, can jump out of the bowel and inflame other parts of the body. Um, and those can be typically your joints would be a number one place, 
the eyes, the skin, people can get rashes, uh, even the bile ducts can get inflamed. And while this isn't in the majority of those who have inflammatory bowel disease, it does occur in about a third or so, uh, one of those. But interestingly, that could happen before the bowel inflammation becomes noticeable. And so we have cases where someone you know, is starting to have this new arthritis for unclear reasons, it's inflamed joints that are really swollen and they see their doctor and sometimes you have to keep in the back of your mind could something like this also be a kind of a clue that there's something else we need to look at to explain it such as uh, inside the gi tract well especially when it's dealing with inflammation inflammation is really bad in your body and by the time it gets to your uh, gi tract it could be uh, you know really further along right potentially Correct. I mean, inflammation is one of these things that, uh, of course, we don't want to have happen. Yeah. Uh, Long-standing inflammation can lead to other problems down the road. And so we want to try and catch things as early as we can so we have the best chance of, of preventing complications and uh, getting it under control quickly. Great. Now, so I'm going to the doctor. I have these signs and symptoms. I talk to the doctor. And now he's going to what is a doctor going to do? Are they going to order some tests? Like how would he diagnose and know for sure that someone has IBD? Yeah. So with IBD, that that's the one of the difficult things about making this diagnosis is there is no one single test that really slam dunk says you have it. You know, some conditions out there, if you get a test, it tells you point blank, you have this condition uh, with inflammatory bowel disease we have to get gather a lot of clues and kind of make a case. Does this fit with inflammatory bowel disease uh, or not? And unfortunately, because we need to gather clues, uh, that means getting a se series of tests to get as many clues together as possible to make this diagnosis. So if a patient sees their doctor with those symptoms that I've described, uh, certainly one of the, the big time tests that will need to be done is taking a camera uh, and, and inserting it into the GI tract and looking around, particularly in the colon, uh, which is called a colonoscopy, or even up into the small intestine via the colonoscopy uh, to see with our own eyes, does this look inflamed or not? Uh, that's an easy enough test to do, but just seeing inflammation still isn't enough for doctors to diagnose you with an inflammatory bowel disease because other things can cause inflammation than just your own immune system. So that's where we take tissue samples or biopsies of the lining. And we're looking for certain features that, that scream, this has been going on for a while, this is chronic. And these are these kind of hallmark features that under the microscope start telling us there's really nothing else here that would do this but inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, this might be a geeky kind of question, but what are those things that you're looking at that can tell that this has been going on for a while? Like when you look in the microscope, like what do you see? Right, so in Crohn's disease, there, there are these areas of walled off kind of inflammation uh, called a granuloma that if, a, if someone looking at it under the microscope spotted a lot of those, that, that's very helpful in saying this is, this is Crohn's disease. Not a lot of things cause granulomas, uh, Crohn's disease is one of the few, and in this context where there's inflammation in the bowel, that's usually what would be doing that. Uh, so that, that's one of the things we're looking for, or, or the pathologists are. We're looking for disruption of the normal architecture. So under the microscope, there's this whole world of how the lining looks. And if that looks distorted, that's a feature of this being chronically inflamed. And so the pathologist is very helpful in helping a yeah. gastroenterologist make a diagnosis. They come back and tell us, are they seeing features of inflammatory bowel disease? Because if they don't, we can still have a high enough suspicion that there still might be this going on and we need to look somewhere else or look in a different way. We don't just say, okay, the pathologist says this is all normal. There's, there's no chronic inflammation here. It, it must not be IBD. That's just another clue that helps us say it is. But if it comes back negative and we're still not feeling um, satisfied with saying this is the, the look is over, it's just irritable bowel syndrome or something else, we have to go look in other ways. And, and we thankfully have uh, nowadays, much more sophisticated imaging of the intestinal tract with CT scans and MRIs, that if we get those, 
Okay. Now we're asking a radiologist to, to see what does the bowel look like in that regard. And, and again, there are other features uh, when looking at it through x-rays that start saying this also looks like uh, there's some there's chronic inflammation going on consistent with, with inflammatory bowel disease. Now, how would you and other gastroenterologists make the distinction between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? So I will say this, the ulcerative colitis is the easier of the two to diagnose. And a large part of that is because it's by definition confined to the colon. So because it's a colitis, which is just inflammation of the colon, it can't inflame anywhere other than the colon um, in terms of inside the bowel. So if you're doing a colonoscopy, which we can see 100% of the colon through that, then you know um, that if this is inflamed and, and there's patterns that, of inflammation that also are seen in ulcerative colitis, meaning it, it always starts in the bottom, the second we put the camera in, if it's ulcerative colitis, we're gonna see inflammation immediately. And it's always going in a very continuous manner through the GI tract or through the colon until it stops. It might inflame the whole colon, it might inflame part, but it's always gonna start in the bottom, it's always gonna be continuous, and it's not going to be anywhere else but the colon. So ulcerative class is easier to diagnose because of those kind of restrictions. Crohn's disease is, is, the, is the beast that's harder to diagnose because mm -hmm. it can inflame anywhere from the mouth to the anus. The small intestine and the colon are the most common areas. But because it can inflame just the small intestine, a colonoscopy could miss it. I can't see the entire small intestine with a colonoscopy. So the colon could look great but yet there may be inflammation in the small bowel. Um, and, and if I get in the colon and I see inflammation there, but right. it's patchy, it's not continuous. Um, the rectum is usually not involved. You can have Crohn's just of the colon, um, which is called Crohn's colitis. Um, so it's still a colitis, but it's not having those features of, of ulcerative colitis. So we call it Crohn's colitis. So those are the things we're looking for. The pattern of inflammation, where is inflamed. The second we see the small intestine getting pretty inflamed, uh, we, we, we abandon ulcerative colitis generally because it just by definition, it can't do that. Oh, thanks for that. That's really interesting. Now, we're not going to go into all the fine details of treatments, but just for our listeners out there, you know, we're not trying to scare people or make people freaked out, but we really want to empower patients to understand that if they have this or someone that they love has, finds out they have IBD, what is the typical treatment, you know, like, and, and, and hope for, you know, living a, a successful, fulfilled life, uh, active life with this uh, diagnosis. Right. So you're right. We don't want to scare people into think that this is some kind of death sentence that they got diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, people live long, normal lives uh, with this condition, but they do need the help of treatments, like you said. Yeah. Um, the natural course, if we just so what does this do on its own if we don't interfere? It will get into remission on its own. It's what we call a, it's like a roller coaster ride. It's a relapsing. So it flares and then it remits. It gets into remission or under control all on its own. Uh, but that roller coaster ride can be very bumpy. You may be spending way more time out of control than in control. And so that's where these medications come into play to keep you in control for as long as possible. And thankfully, this day and age, we now have more treatments than ever before. Um, new drugs are coming out every few months, it seems, um, to work on treating this inflammation. And because of those resources, we're in a better position to, to medically treat this condition because 25 years ago and, and prior, surgery was one of those typical treatments because if you had no if you had very few medications to work with right. then all you could all you could resort to is operating and now it's the inverse we're, we're operating less and less and we're using way more medications to, to try and prevent people from needing surgery to remove damaged bowel uh, and keep out of the hospital keep off of steroids these are things that are our goals and thankfully, we're able to accomplish this now more than ever before. So people, if they take their medicines, they can stay in remission, which means free, free of symptoms. But we also want to get the disease to be gone too. So when we look, I see no inflammation. And we're able to do that. And people, again, can, can tend to, to, to still do the things they want to do. But 
like any chronic disease, there can be flare ups, people can, despite all of our best efforts, have uh, symptoms come back, and we just have to get that back under control. Yes, and for the patients out there, um, there are some wonderful um, patient advocates and people who are thriving with IBD. We've interviewed several of them in our previous podcast episodes. There's such a, a big movement in the whole biopsychosocial approach. There's diet, there's GI psychology. We have a wonderful webinar by Dr. Stephen Loop, who gives the lowdown on IBD if you were just diagnosed and goes through all the different aspects, what you need to expect. And it kind of allays some of the fears out there. So Dr. Crocker, you've given a great overview. I really feel that our listeners out there have a better understanding of what it is, what it is to look for. I want to ask you a question. You know, a lot of times women, right, we're the the caregivers of the families and we're the ones pushing our either significant others or to go to the doctor. What are your suggestions or what are your tips for for families who maybe there's a loved one that's dealing with these symptoms and they think it's nothing, how can they kind of guide them gently to your office or to another gastroenterologist's office? Like, what do you suggest? Again, as we are advancing in our uh, healthcare technology, there are now more ways for patients to get in touch with physicians. Before you had to call the phone, and and get a referral and and wait for someone to call you back and all this. But nowadays with all these electronic medical records, it's it's a lot easier to just reach out to your primary care doctor. I mean, most folks are established with one. uh, And if they are, it's now very easy to send essentially an email to your primary care doctor and say, listen, um, I have these symptoms. What do you think? Uh, You know, this uh, notion of trying to dismiss symptoms, you know, in the past, I understand why that might have been because it was hard to get in touch with your doctor and it was kind of more difficult to get some sort of feedback. But nowadays, with a couple of clicks of a button, you can send a message out to your doctor. What's the harm in that, right? What, what, what do you have to lose in just saying, hey, what do you think of this? And I can almost guarantee that if you start saying, I'm seeing blood in the stool with new diarrhea and these things, they will get you in to be seen. And, and they can be the ones instrumental to get you in to see a gastroenterologist where we take it from there. One of the questions patients always ask me is, um, you know, is this diet related? What can I do to my diet? You know, they're looking for easy changes, things they have full control over without needing to take the first medication. And I get that. Uh, we always look for what's the most straightforward, simplistic solution. Um, and in the world of IBD, you would think diet must be a huge um, factor, but in reality, because it's so much more complex than that, um, if you just eat a certain food or not, it doesn't really make a big deal as to whether you're going to get it or you're going to get better from it. And, And so the easy answer is I tell folks, you know, if you know what disagrees with you when you eat it, certainly avoid that. If you're really looking for a diet that could help. We know that a specific carbohydrate diet, which basically is easy, an easy way to look at that is no junk food. So if you just kind of cut out a lot of junk food, um, you're avoiding uh, a lot of sugary foods, uh, high processed foods, and just try and just eat healthy fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, then that diet alone may make a big difference in your symptoms. Uh, but again, we're talking about are we helping symptoms or are we actually helping the disease itself? And when it comes to inflammatory bowel, a lot of things what people will do may just help the symptoms. And while that's great, we also want to try and get that disease to get better too. So um, the diets can help with symptoms. Certainly if you're smoking and you have Crohn's disease, you need to quit. Exercising can help. Uh, minimizing those NSAID drugs I mentioned also, especially if it's Crohn's disease, uh, can help as well. So those are some diet lifestyle things we, we preach to everyone. But again, it's there's no silver bullet. Um, you could do all of that and you're still going to need some help with medications to get that disease to get better. Great. And finally, one last question. What is the, the outlook for patients with IBD? What, what, is, what do they need to know if they, had, if they have this? 
Well, like with any chronic condition, you know, there's good news and bad news. The bad news is inflammatory bowel disease is not something we can easily just cure. Um, you can't take a course of medication like you would an antibiotic and after the two weeks, it's gone. Uh, unfortunately, these are lifelong diseases um, that people have to figure out a way to live with. And so the good news is, is that we have all these new medications I mentioned that can get people into what we call remission or symptoms or, or periods of no symptoms. And when you're feeling well, um, you can continue to feel well for long, long, long periods of time. Now, in worst case scenarios, some folks who have ulcerative colitis will get their colon removed. That's one of the treatment options if you're not responding to medications. And that can essentially cure the disease. But if you ask several people, can, can inflammatory bowel be cured? Even with removing the diseased bowel, um, there can be some types of inflammation that come back. And so the immune system is just a very smart thing. It has a memory. It doesn't, it doesn't forget what it wants to do. So we have to be vigilant. We have to, to stay on top of um, flare-ups and treating them appropriately. But at the end of the day, the good news is patients live long lives, just as well as someone who doesn't have IBD. Uh, they can be healthy if they take their medications and still do all the same things that everyone else can do who don't have IBD. Yes. And we have talked to several patients with IBD and we, you can check out those episodes if you're listening and you'll be inspired by these wonderful patients. But thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Crocker. I really appreciate your time and all that you do to help educate and advocate for patients. We've covered a lot of ground today, but there's more information about IBD on the American College of Gastroenterology's website at gi.org, our website, gastrogirl.com, and also on giondemand.com. Thank you for listening, everyone. And thank you again, Dr. Crocker. All right. You're welcome. You all take care. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.